So I'm Kara Fravor. I'm the Business Services Director for the National Young Farmers Coalition. Uh, some of you might have heard this spiel because you were in a webinar that we hosted with um, USDA's Office of Community Food Systems two weeks ago. So if so, it'd be great to know if you're returning. Um, so, uh, but just to give you a little background about NYFC before we start in on the meat of today's presentation, I wanted to just let you know we are, um, we're a coalition of young farmers that was started in 2010 by three young farmers um, who were facing kind of similar issues uh, to th things we hear from farmers around the country, issues with credit and land access and stuff like that. Um, and so they started a, a coalition which has grown rapidly over the last seven years. Um, and we uh, often talk about our work as being sort of threefold. So we um, do lots of work around uh, around policy change. So um, trying to improve federal and state programs specifically to make sure that they're addressing the needs that young farmers have. And we say young farmers because we want to be sure that there's a new generation ready to take the reins of growing growing and raising food for America once um, the current generation ages out. But these issues are similar to all kinds of beginning farmers around the country. So it's not just young people. Um, and in addition to that policy change, we are a chapter-led organization. So we have 41 chapters in 29 states. Um, so there's hopefully one near you. Um, you can check out our website to find a local chapter. And if you don't see one near you, you can reach out to, um, to think about starting one. Um, these networks, these chapters, which are definitely run by farmers running, running businesses, um, are doing policy work as well at their state level, at their local level. And then they're also just sort of forging friendships and um, business partnerships. They're buying co collectively and they're um, skill sharing and, and getting together to kind of support one another. Uh, in addition to that, we have a business services arm of the organization and that's what I do. And that's kind of where this presentation fits in, I think, to the work that the National Young Farmers do, Young Farmers Coalition does. So we're kind of helping farmers to navigate some of the federal opportunities and some of the federal regulations that impact the businesses that they run. Um, we do some work around uh, farm service agency loans. We have a guidebook out on that. Uh, I do a lot of work in FISMA's produce safety rule. And then we do some stuff on crop insurance. We do a lot of work around land access. Um, and then we have, we're a membership-based organization. So we have membership discounts at um, agricultural businesses across the country. Uh, you should check those out. Um, and those are kind of some of the business services that we offer and we're expanding into other areas as well. Um, and so uh, about, about six months ago, Tegan reached out to, Tegan reached out to me and um, said that they were maybe interested in connecting with some, uh, some farmers who were interested in selling through institutions. We do see that a lot of the young farmers here that are, in our networks and in um, in surveys that we've done, a lot of those farmers are selling directly. So sometimes through CSA or through farmers markets or directly to restaurants. Um, but uh, anecdotally and through surveys as well, we find that a lot of people are really curious about how farm to school works and how they might be able to sell within the farm to school network. And so it was fun to have uh, take and reach out and say, hey, we're interested in connecting to young farmers. And then to also be hearing from young farmers at workshops around the country that are saying, how exactly does that work? And how can we, how can we access that market as well? So that's why we're all here today. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Tegan and Matt from USDA's Office of Community Food Systems, which oversees the farm to school program. I think we've done all the housekeeping stuff, but for anybody who's hopping on now, um, if you are coming on, we're going to mute you and we're going to stop your video. However, there is a chat function. And I just want to ask everybody right now to see how this chat function is working. I'm going to ask you to go in there and um, go under chat and choose questions. Kara, NYFC, that's me. And uh, let me know if you are a farmer 
or um, if you're someone who works for a nonprofit or for a school, a government employee or something else. And you can use as many words as you want to tell me who you are. Um, and we are recording this. So we will um, be able to post it to people who weren't able to attend today. So I think that that's all. Does anybody else have, do either of you want to jump in on any housekeeping things I should say before we move forward? Great. I'm yep. going to stop sharing. And then there we go. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kara, for, for, that, for that great introduction. Um, we've been really excited to have this opportunity to partner with the Young Farmers Coalition. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit about my team, but I just I wanted to start by saying one of the reasons we're so excited is we primarily do right now work with schools, or that's been our primary communication channel in school districts, and we just hear all the time how they feel like their major barrier with farm to school is finding enough farmers who want to sell to schools. And so to have so much interest in this has, has been really awesome um, for us to hear. So I am Tegan Bernstein. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Regional Farm to School Lead. I work for the USDA's Office of Community Food Systems. Uh, we have three sort of primary buckets of work. Um, and essentially, we do training and technical assistance, similar to this webinar. Uh, to farmers, to school districts, also to state agencies. We also administer the USD Farm to School Grant Program that we went into a little bit more detail in the first webinar that Kara sent out, so there's plenty of information there about that. And the main takeaway is that farmers are eligible to apply, and we hope that everyone listening to this will consider that. The RFA will be released in the fall. And our third and final bucket um, is, our, is our research, and essentially, to this point, it's really consisted of our USDA Farm to School Census, and we also covered that more in detail in our first webinar, and that information is available. But in short, if you're interested, if you Google USDA Farm to School Census, it will pull right up for you, and you'll be able to search by state and see how all of the school districts um, answered the questions related to how they participate in Farm to School. So very quick synopsis. I want to take a minute to introduce my, um, my colleague, Matt Benson, who is also on the line. Hi, Matt. Hey. There he is. So Matt will be presenting the second half of this presentation, and he's our senior technical advisor uh, in DC. Matt has a long background in farm to school. We've actually been working together for a long time now, um, not forever at the USDA. We both worked in other organizations before, Matt with Cooperative Extension, which is when I met him in Virginia. Um, and I was working that time for a nonprofit in Pennsylvania. So um, yeah, it's, it's great to be able to present with him. And he's, he's just a, a wealth of information. He didn't want me to give him too much of an introduction. So I'll just leave it there. Um, so moving on to our agenda for today. We're going to hopefully frame a school food, and Tara mentioned institutions, and for this webinar, we, and our work, we do focus on a really pre-K to 12, any meal program that, um, that serves students inside of a child nutrition program. So the USDA works on child nutrition programs, and if any institution participates in that, that's basically our, our target audience, and we really, hope that we can make the point that it's a true market opportunity. Um, we're going to go over a little bit of school food procurement basics. This is a little bit, um, it's ideally building upon our previous webinar. And while procurement primarily is what the schools need to be concerned with, I think it's helpful for um, particularly new and beginning farmers who are starting to sell the schools to understand just some basics of the language that they know when they approach schools, um, what what sort of framework the schools are working from with how they're allowed to buy products. It's not the same at all as what restaurants or when you're working with a one-on-one -on -one individual at a farmer's market. Um, definitely going to touch on building relationships with schools and, of course, some first steps you can take to start to sell to schools. Next slide. So before we get too far down that road, I did just want to give a brief synopsis of what we mean by farm to school at the USDA. 
Um, so the, there are three buckets again for, for what we mean by farm to school and school gardens or experiential education, really connecting um, students to the source of their food is definitely a bucket. Serving local food in the child nutrition program um, is the second one, and that's what we're focusing on today, how to get more local food into child nutrition programs. And of course, that education, the nutrition and agriculture education, some people call it food literacy, and here it's referred to as curriculum connections. And we do use the term farm to school, but of course we also mean um, farm to summer. There are summer meal programs, which can be an excellent opportunity to tap into this market, as well as pre-K as well. And we say farm to preschool, some people say farm to early child care. It's really all, all the same thing. So that's really the breadth of what we're talking about when we use the term farm to school. And all of these pictures here um, are pictures of real farm to school programs. So we, we love sort of sharing those. And yeah, we, we, we can just move on to the next slide, but I love talking about, um, talking about our program there. So what types of products? Definitely, you hear a lot about fruits and vegetables with farm to school. And absolutely, we mean fruits and vegetables. That is where um, a lot of farm to school programs get started, essentially because schools, now thanks to the new meal pattern changes, do need to serve a wide variety of fruits and vegetables in the school meal program since around 2010. And so, Often schools are finding that their mainline distributors aren't offering the variety and they're not offering maybe the quality that they want. And so a lot of schools get started in farm to school wanting to really diversify that. And not only to meet the meal pattern, but also to really, you know, entice students to participate in child nutrition programs. But at the USDA, we mean the entire plate. Well, this is what we call the entire plate. This is representative of um, what child nutrition programs have to serve for a school lunch. So you need to have a protein, here it's represented with a fish, so we mean fisher people, as we say in the mid-Atlantic. Some people call them other things, we say fisher people. Um, meat, poultry, we have programs that are serving local bison. Um, we have programs that are serving, I just was at a conference yesterday in New Jersey where there's a district that's serving local dogfish. Um, and they're really excited about that and really want that to expand throughout New Jersey as it's the most plentiful fish in the Atlantic waters right now. Um, and it's something um, that, you know, fishermen are trying to really increase, and we need to maybe work on the name because I think that it hasn't taken off yet, but dogfish um, is on the menu in New Jersey. Beans, greens, and flowers, we have districts that are, you know, getting freshly milled flowers. You know, it's not every district, but it's happening. And then eggs. Um, absolutely, that's something that, we, that we're seeing more and more of as well. And of course, dairy. Okay, so next slide. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so essentially, and Matt, you can just click through here. So essentially, this is a this is Forest Grove Farm selling at a farmers market, and this is you know, for people on this line are probably familiar with this setup. You have to worry about packaging. You've got to make those perfect bunches. Um, you generally can charge a premium price, and you really want that perfect produce set up. And um, I came from into this sort of field from working in farmers market. So this level of marketing and this level of setup and this level of production is very familiar to me. And I just am putting this up here to say that this is not the school food market. And there are, um, well, you know, everyone I'm sure on this line knows farmers markets can be awesome, but also there are a lot of work. And it's a lot of work trying to have those very perfect pieces um, you know, all bunched together, displayed perfectly, standing there or having, you know, to hire someone to stand there for eight hours, not to mention the transportation and the travel, and not really knowing what you're going to make at the end of the day. So just going to leave that there in that we are leaving essentially this a little bit behind, and we're, we're moving into the school food market. Next slide. Okay, so I get asked, um, I'm bringing this, this imaginary dollar here to kind of give you a snapshot. And we did go into a little bit more detail in our first webinar with this as well. So we're just touching here. Um, you know, there is, a, I don't know if, if it's really a perception, but I think that there's um, sort of a story out there that there isn't any money for school food. And um, while I think well, I think that that, um, that there is, I'm not saying that's not a valid sense in a sort of a universal sense. Um, there, 
are lots of dollars that are being put into our child nutrition programs. And I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what that really looks like. So in child nutrition, and this is, this is our imaginary dollar that schools have to spend on the meal, on the actual food. Reimbursement per student, per two school lunch, there are varying factors depending upon essentially the socioeconomic status of the group of students inside of that school, but it's around 325 a student per meal um, and approximately a dollar to a dollar 40, some districts spend a dollar 50 is just for the food. So out of that, we out of that imaginary dollar, there tends to be some funds that districts can spend on commodity foods, on USDA foods to help supplement their meal. And then Department of Defense Fresh, which is a produce program, also is a, is a smaller portion of that. It's around like, let's just say 10% of that dollar. And 60 to 70 cents on that dollar is their cash reimbursement. And that is really the money that we're talking about because that's the money that schools have to go out and purchase products directly. And we'll go to the next slide. Next slide. There we go. So schools um, spend more than, and this is actually, this number is not exactly accurate. It's $16.7 billion on national school lunch and national school breakfast. So I think there was a little bit of a flip-flop typo there, but it's a huge market. And we can go to the next slide. This is a snapshot from our census. We also just want to note here, you know, oh, that's a big market. But then the next question that comes up is how much of that is actually going to local products, to self-defined local products? And this is where our farm to school census comes in. And we are about to release a new census um, a year from now in 2019. But our most recent census showed us that at least 42% of districts participate in some type of farm to school activities. Um, so that's 42,000 schools, and we can go to the next slide. And about $790 million were spent on local products in child nutrition programs, and that's in one year. That's not over a period of years, and that is just normal reimbursement money. That is not grant money or anything extra. That is just the reimbursement money that schools receive for, the, for their child nutrition programs. So I, I point this out to say, well, you might think, it's sort of cents on the dollar when you're talking about quantity, and this is where it really varies from the farmer's market model, where you're kind of dealing with individuals who are serving a family. You are dealing with institutions that are serving a community. And we are, when you're feeding a community, you are talking about larger dollars because you're talking about larger numbers of students and larger number of children. All right, next slide. Okay, are there any questions so far? I just want to stop there because I feel like that was a lot of concepts that I threw up and just want to open things up. Let's see, and you can text Tara or type things in. Oh, I'm seeing there are lots of things in, in chat about who people are, but I don't necessarily see any questions. No questions yet. Okay, thanks, Tara. Feel free to shoot them to Kara and we can just answer them as we go. All right, so procurement rules. We're not going to get too deep into this again because it is the schools that need to worry about appropriate procurement. You are just responsible for selling your product, but I, I think it is helpful. So often we wonder, you know, why are these rules important? They seem a little bit you know, onerous, uh, it's just like some more, you know, red tape. And while I understand that perspective, absolutely it's there because the reimbursement dollars are our tax dollars. Every dollar that goes into child nutrition programs comes from our taxes, right? So we want to make sure that everyone and every farmer and every company has equal and fair ground to be able to have access to that market. Um, you know, we also want to make sure that those dollars are really going to the recipients that they're intended for, right? The students who need those school meals for their nutrition. Um, and we just, we just want to go over it again because we want to know that there are regulations that schools have to follow. Next slide. So there's four key concepts. The first one goes really well with selling local products and that's American Grown and there is a regulation that all products that are served in child nutrition programs must be produced and processed in the U.S. 
Um, Puerto Rico is slightly different. They have their own rules about making sure that things are from Puerto Rico as much as possible. And there are some other exceptions for Hawaii, but primarily things need to be um, processed and grown in the U.S. Of course, like with every rule, there are exceptions. So obviously you are allowed to have bananas. We don't have a large banana market. So if there aren't things that are normally produced in, um, you know, what is called, uh, there's a few terms for it, but essentially an adequate amount uh, to serve the market, you're allowed to, to go outside of the U.S. But there really has been a lot of emphasis on this recently, and schools are getting extra reminders that, you know, everything that they need to buy really should be grown and processed in the U.S. Um, all right, they need to know local and state regulations. So there are federal procurement rules, and sometimes states decide that they want to add on some additional ones. So our rules kind of create the baseline, and they're allowed to do that. So just want to be clear, we're referring um, the federal rules. Free and open competition is, is the third concept, and probably, I would say, the most emphasized pillar. You know, absolutely, we don't want um, anyone to, to be just improperly using these funds, you know, giving someone a contract because they know that. And we want to make sure it's a fair and even playing ground and everyone has access uh, to this market. And then responsive and responsible. And essentially what that means is that vendors or farmers or companies that respond and serve the child nutrition market need to be responsive. They need to actually provide what they say they're going to provide and they have to be responsible, delivering things on time. All right, next. So again, we're not getting too deep in here, but there are a variety of ways that uh, procurement methods that school has, and they're all really determined by what is called the small purchase threshold. And the federal threshold is $150,000. So essentially anything, any purchase that is under $150,000 can happen in either an informal or a micro way, and the micro limit is lower at $3,500. And if your purchase is over that amount, you have to go through a formal process. You have to put out um, a request for a proposal, a bid has to be released, and someone has to formally respond to it. We generally see farm to school programs starting and maybe functioning for many, many years under an informal type of procurement. Um, and this is commonly known as three bids and a buy, where you need to call at least you know, three vendors for, a, not, it's not just price, it's quality plus price. And, see who has the best quality product at the best price, and then you purchase that product from them. Um, a micro purchase doesn't need to be, you don't have to call three people, but it does have this lower limit of 3,500, and there's a few other rules there. But I just wanted to share this so that you kind of have an idea when you're approaching a district or approaching a school that they know that they do have to follow a procurement method, and they might sort of bring that up for you, and that you have that information to feel really comfortable um, knowing they could do an informal, they might not even know they can do a micro, and now you have you have this this option and this language to refer to. Next, can I ask? Oh, Tara, a yes. Um, when you do that three bids and a buy, how similar do the two products have to be to be on a bid? So, if you as a as a school procurement person wanted to buy bok choy, do you have to compare it to other bok choys, or do you have to compare it to yeah, generally, yes. So um, and it doesn't need to be product by product. It could be multiple products on one. It could be bok choy and romaine, you know, depending upon the vendors in your area. It's, it's very relative and contextual, meaning um, it really depends what is available and who is serving your community. Um, so, but it does need to be product to product. So it needs to be bok choy to bok choy. And if, if you can't find another bok choy in your area and no one else can deliver that, that would be a reason to, to document that. And there's a, we have a longer presentation about, you know, how schools do this. But essentially, they would note, we really wanted bok choy for our program. And only this farm could, could supply us bok choy. And that could be a reason that you would just, without being able to get to other bids, you would award that to the one farm. Does that help? Okay. All right, so forward contracts. I'm going to start to skip along here because I can see that I'm running a little bit behind. Um, so we hear a lot about forward contracts. 
Um, and forward contracts are great because essentially there's a lot of planning involved, which means a little bit more security, both for the farmer knowing where their product. And when I say farmer again, it's you know could be a dairy farmer, it could be a fisher person. So I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to. We're just using it as a catch-all here. It could be a rancher, um, but essentially it's any contract established in advance. So it could be a small purchase, like informal, like we just talked about, or it could be formal. Really, the only difference with that is is timing, um, where schools know what they're going to get, and we can go to the next slide here, and farmers also know what they're going to get. So there's some benefits and, and risks here, um, but schools love to plan in advance, and again, I don't want to stereotype, but I also know that some farmers love to plan in advance and love to know they're going to have a market for all of that, you know, rutabaga they just planted. Uh, so I, I think that forward contracts can, can be a way to go. Um, and that we also always want to make sure that there are sort of contingency plans built in that protect both of you inside of forward contracts, where should something happen to your crop that you're not held to that or that you're allowed to purchase a backup from either a neighbor or someone else. And also schools are going to allow you to make that substitution. So this is part of the communication. Next. All right. So. Um, Essentially, uh, specifications is a procurement term, and essentially that is when a school is creating a, the list of things they want for their program, they're going to write specifications. And when they're trained in procurement, they're encouraged to make them as specific as possible, um, to really be clear to everyone what they're looking for, because it's not really fair, this comes back to fairness and competition, if they're just saying, I want a leafy green, right? And we know, you know, leafy greens can have a huge variation in price and can have a huge variation in labor, depending upon what you're talking about. And someone comes in, you know, really low, but you're giving them this amazing green here. So we really want that to be as clear as possible. So if, you're, if you want bok choy, we want you to say bok choy and how much bok choy and what condition, all of those things. Um, so it's a way of making sure schools can get what they want. Um, the one thing that schools cannot do is they cannot say, I want local bok choy. And there is um, a rule that was written that explains why they can't use the word local. Okay, so it's just, it's, it's not allowed. But what they can do is they can use all of these other terms to indicate that they want local without using the word local. So they can use a variety unique to a region. They can say we want it delivered within 48 hours of harvest. They can say we want it from a farm that's less than, you know, 50 acres that grows at least, you know, 30 varieties of crops. They can say we want primarily hand harvested X. Um, origin labeling, we want every box that has the farm name and origin on it. Um, so, so these are all specifications that schools can use that they cannot put this is a bid for local bok choy. So um, just throwing that out there, just so that, that you're aware of that. All right, next. Okay, so geographic preference. This is a procurement tool that schools can use to on paper when they're awarding, um, when they're looking at bids and they're looking at the prices that were received to give a preference to a local product. <laughs> So um, I know it seems all it seems all a little bit silly when you talk about it. They can't use the word local, but they can give a geographic preference. And so essentially, they're allowed to note um, a percentage more that they would be um, willing, for evaluation purposes, uh, to to essentially give a farm. And it only applies to unprocessed products. So that means. Anything that is raw, cut, frozen, it can be sliced, diced, meat can be ground, milk can be pasteurized, but nothing can, can be used, not, no like tortillas, nothing like that. Um, and they would write this out there and it, it essentially gives a little bit of um, assistance to, uh, to be able to source locally. And this is an option that schools have and any school can use this at any time, should they want to. Okay, next. So schools get to define what they mean by local. This is another big question, like what does the USDA mean by local? And thankfully we said, we're not going to define that. That is for schools to define. 
Um, we, they do, if they want to use geographic preference, they have to have a definition. They have to write that down. Um, but a school defines it, they write it down. It can be, you know, a mile radius. It can be a region. It can be a city. Our nation is wide and vast, and our geography is very, very different. And I think this works really well. We know that there are some districts in Vermont that have, like, a 20-mile radius. And there are some states that have a four state radius for their definition of local. So it varies. And just like our nation is diverse, I think that it works well. All right, next. Next. OK, so um, we'll just go to next. This is a procurement process. I don't think we have to get so into that. All right, next. Okay, so how to connect with schools. What are, what are some best practices here? So I think definitely a great first step is to get to know your local food service director. You want to know what they're working with. What kind of a kitchen do they have? Um, you want to know what their menus are like. Most schools work off of a menu cycle. Some of them are um, monthly. Some of them are bi-weekly. Some, some schools are creating their menus week by week. Some of them create them by season, so they'll have like a fall season menu. Some states require they submit their menus, you know, six months in advance for approval. And so they are planning their menus out six months before that. So I just can't emphasize connecting as early as possible, not only so you know what to plan and have a market for your product, but also so that they have a time to really work that product onto your menu. Um, and then you definitely want to know what type of meals. There's school lunch, there's school breakfast, there's after school snacks. You know, kind of ask, like, how many meals do you serve here a day? It could be a lot more than school lunch. All right, next. So first step in getting to know your food service director. How busy is a food service director? I think it aligns somewhat, at least, and I'm mid-Atlantic, northeast based, so I'm speaking mainly to our, to our seasons here. But it aligns somewhat to how busy is a farmer with the regards except for the big dip in July where they're not so busy and possibly on vacation. But August, September, October, food service directors and most farmers that I know are super busy. It's like a crazy time. Pretty much up until, you know, November, December, and then possibly January, February, and then things skyrocket again right around this time again, right? So it, the overlap that farmers and food service directors have really is the winter, where you're, even though you're still probably doing tons of things, you're not as insanely busy as you are um, the rest of the year. So it's really a great time to reach out to them if you're, if you're thinking about that. You know, their year isn't as crazy either. Next. All right. I think I kind of went over most of this. Um, yeah. We're going to go next. Learning the infrastructure, our, our second step. What do schools want to buy? Um, you know, some some kitchens are literally just like a heat and serve oven and a three compartment sink, and they don't have anything else, right? So, you know, asking to meet your food service director and ask them to see their kitchen, you know, just out of interest. Or you can also invite them to your farm, whatever you would prefer. I think, I think both things have, have worked in different circumstances. But some, some districts, even you know, more rural districts, might work with one central kitchen where they do have a lot of scratch cooking opportunities, and then they distribute it out to the other kitchens. Um, even the smallest kitchens that don't really have much often have opportunity for salad bars, you know, if, you, if you are a diversified vegetable farm. And then you also want to start that conversation, you know, maybe they can serve apples or maybe they have some capability to do some chopping, but they also might need some things, you know, pre-diced, pre-sliced, and that's another conversation. Just, just sort of a consideration when you're thinking about what types of products uh, might work best for them or where to start that conversation. Next. All right. Next. Okay, I think that we went over most of this, um, but I think it's a good point to review that there are menus within each program. Um, so there's a salad bar menu, and then there's also a hot lunch menu. And then some schools, and more and more we're seeing this, will have like a harvest of the month, which I think is a great opportunity to break into the school food market, being that key product that they will, you know, serve maybe once a week, but all month long. Next. 
Okay, so this again, I, I do think that this works over a large swath of our country, not the very, very, very deep south who might not have so many storage crops, but in farm to school, generally hardy greens and storage crops work. Um, it's something that we see time and time again. And part of that is because obviously storage crops store. Um, and with the hardy greens, a lot of it has to do with the meal pattern change where districts now have to serve a dark green leafy vegetable regularly on their menus. And that is something that's relatively new. So, I, and it is something that districts sometimes struggle with. Like how many times can you menu, menu just romaine lettuce? You know, I think that having that variety, I mean, the answer is a lot if you don't have other options, but um, ideally they will have other options. And I think this is, this is a real market opportunity for, for small farmers to fill that niche where districts have to serve a dark leafy green vegetable. Um, and often their distributors are offering romaine lettuce and that's, that's their option there. Next. That's right. So, Harp, you you know I don't I don't think I need to tell anyone on this call. You know you know that storage crops work because you can store them up until you have the demands. Like for that harvest of the month item that you know that might happen in the winter, you're going to have your storage crops ready. Um, it's again typically a one-time harvest, so it's less labor for you, and you often can offer it at possibly um, you know a, a reasonable or I'll just say a price that schools can afford. Um, it can be that market in the winter months, that's when there can be a real demand for this product and you often don't have those other markets. And you can make that one big shipment because they're storage crops, they're not, you don't need to deliver them every week. Next. Yeah, so this, this is a good point too. I mentioned the leafy greens, but many of those storage crops, those hard, you know, whether it is sweet potatoes or whether it is butternut squash, um, you know, they, they fit that, there's a red orange category on the plate that they also have to meet. And so often those crops meet that, meet that requirement. So it's something that schools are looking for. And next. Right, and this I think is my, is sort of the best point, but there's a lot of wiggle room in terms of timing with greens, primarily because they can grow relatively quickly, right? And you, you can harvest and grow and harvest and grow. Um, and they tend to lend themselves well to contracts as well, because again, with those storage crops, you tend to, you know, to know when they're coming and have a relatively significant crop at, at a set period of time. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions so far, see if anything has come in. We haven't had any questions so far, but definitely okay. if things come up, guys, please chat them to me at questions, Kara. Okay, great. And so I'm also going to take this opportunity to pass things over to my colleague, Matt Benson, who's going to finish out the presentation. So feel free to take it away, Matt. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tegan. Um, Kara, can everyone hear me? Great. Um, thanks, Tegan. It's great to be with everyone today. Uh, as Tegan said, with USDA's Farm to School program, uh, being housed at the Food and Nutrition Service, we work closely with schools and school districts. And it's great to be able to go back and get back to my roots and working and talking with farmers and, and all, the, all the folks out there who are producing our, our wonderful food. So it really feels good to be back. Just picking up on where Tegan left off, if you remember step four was to get to know what school meals are served each day and how many schools, uh, how many students usually participate. So that, so for, for us that relates to, um, and for farmers that relates to considering the volume of food purchased and what types of products purchased might fit with uh, the meals uh, currently being served. So again, when meeting with uh, school nutrition directors, it's really helpful to try and speak the same language that they use. Schools oftentimes think of things uh, in terms of um, serving sizes or serving sizes needed and the number of meals served. And that's probably a little different than uh, oftentimes what farmers think of when thinking about different types of, 
of products and, and quantity. Oftentimes we think of we think of farmers thinking about things in case sizes or in the or in the pounds uh, produced. And so just speaking that same language, being able to equate case sizes and pounds to serving sizes and to volume um, is going to be super helpful for for working with schools. Schools, um, because of regulations, have to provide uh, a half cup or one cup of fresh fruits and uh, fruits and vegetables, not fresh fruits and vegetables, but fruits and vegetables for for meal for meal served. And so um, there's really a, a increasing market, a growing market for has been over over time for for uh, for produce and and things like that. Um, when figuring out the total volume that a school may need. Uh, we have this little uh, equation at the bottom here. Um, the pounds per meal times the meals per serve times the uh, menu products, how many times a product appears in a menu will get you that total volume. Schools often uh, will think about menus on a cycle, um, either being a, a week or a month long, kind of rotating different products throughout that week or throughout that month. And so it's good to know that uh, when trying to uh, establish uh, contacts or contracts or work with schools. Um, kind of picking up on that, of course, um, schools are going to need to purchase products at the right price because they are working in with within uh, a budget. And as I, as everyone here knows, um, farmers are going to want to be able to sell at that right price, right? So they can make a profit, so they can take care of their families, so they can spend more time on the farm, less time working a second job. So um, just knowing that and, and knowing that trying to uh, fit that into, into your business equation is, is helpful. There is some uh, information online at AMS's website, uh, which, which is kind of referenced here, that talks about uh, pricing points that schools purchase product at or other wholesale market, markets to give farmers an idea of what the, of what the products are currently trading at. Um, some schools may be willing to, to uh, spend a little bit more money occasionally on a special product for some special day or for some special event. And so there's a, there may be an opportunity to kind of uh, um, uh, go a little bit non-traditional with, with the types of products that they may buy or that you may not even think of a school purchasing because of, because of that. Um, because of you, you thinking them they're on a budget, but sometimes there is that opportunity for a for a special menu or to sell something that may be out of the norm. Um, some guiding questions to ask yourself when thinking about selling to a school or working with a school potentially is are, are listed here in, in a few of them. Um, for example, am I growing or producing the products that a school may be interested in purchasing to meet their volume? or their needs. This seems so um, simple and so in your face and so common sense, but you know, it's really helpful. You're going you're gonna to have to think about that. You, they're not going to be able to purchase everything that, that all farms uh, produce. What types of products are schools most interested uh, in purchasing? Um, in terms of volume, and do I produce enough product that they would likely purchase from me? You know, schools think of products and, and quantity much larger than, you know, other uh, direct or intermediated markets, such as farmers markets and things like that. So con considering volume is really important. And, you know, uh, in terms of your, your farm or your uh, business operation, should I specialize in one product? Um, when I was working with Virginia Cooperative Extension, I knew a farmer who specialized in growing hydroponic bib lettuce. Uh, uh, all winter because of um, it being a great product to grow in the winter season. And he marketed his tail off and sold his tail off all throughout the state of Virginia uh, on that one product. So he chose that bib lettuce to specialize in, really go all in, and uh, had a one-up on, on that market throughout the season. Um, step five is uh, getting to know your school's preferred methods for receiving uh, deliveries and sourcing of products. When meeting with the with the school, you have a lot of business to discuss um, when making that when making that business transaction. 
There's obviously, as some of the things that Tegan outlined earlier, lots of different options for contracts. Um, talking with the school about what they mean or what they're looking for in terms of standard sizes of different products that you're producing and what types of sizes that would work best for the school lunch line. Um, everyone uses that example of often trying to sell smaller types of products, for example, smaller apples, because little kids and, and students in elementary schools can bite into those smaller apples a little bit easier than, than those large Hurricane apples that are, that are uh, a little big for their hands. Um, talking about the, the, uh, the preferred distribution model or the, the preferred uh, delivery systems, how does, how does that school or school district prefer to receive their deliveries? Is it in the morning? Is it once a week? Is it at night? Is it during the day? What types of delivery systems do you, are they looking to, uh, to work with farmers on? Is it one school or, and they're gonna then distribute out to schools throughout the district or would they like you to go to um, several different schools throughout that district? Sometimes um, when selling local foods, it could be a new purchase for a school. And so it's really, um, it's really important for farmers to know what uh, new purchases, um, how schools work with new purchase and what their purchasing systems look like so that you know when you're gonna get paid and how you're gonna get paid um, in this new business transaction. We wanted to just very quickly dive into a couple uh, case studies examples of different farms selling and working with schools. Here's a, here's a great example of a beautiful family from Minnesota, Open Hands Farm. That, uh, that was able to um, have a really good relationship with schools. You can see the gentleman there wearing the Minnesota Thursdays t-shirt where uh, Minnesota, schools in Minnesota try and buy local uh, on Thursdays as part of their, um, as part of their campaign and, and part of uh, their marketing opportunity for, for students. But this family decided to uh, forward contract with a school. So that means that they were received money up front for a certain type of product to deliver throughout that school year. And that type of product was uh, carrots. And so they grew long, they grew and tried to grow really the best long, straight, thick carrots that would work well in lots of different types of uh, settings in the school meals. So they could shred the carrot, they could produce a matchstick carrot, they could produce a coin carrot. Um, and so they focused on one product and by doing that, and by um, having that forward contract with schools, they were able to kind of use that and leverage that to apply for additional grant funding and get funding to improve their farm infrastructure. Uh, so it was a great kind of business transaction, but it was also a great way for them to uh, improve, their, improve their farm. The second example um, is a school that, the second example is a farmer that was able to sell to school utilizing some of their seconds and less perfect produce. They have produced, as shown here, this beautiful butternut squash um, and traditionally marketed that through direct marketing channels, through restaurants, through farmers markets, through farm cooperative stands. But um, they decided to plant an extra field of this butternut squash and, and still, again, uh, marketed and sold their products through this through, through those direct markets, but because they had a had a larger quantity, they were able to take their their uh, less perfect produce and sell it at a, at a little bit of a discount because of volume to schools, where schools could then turn that less perfect produce um, into something that would work really well for their school meals. You know, if the, the students aren't going to see. Um, see the whole butternut squash, but they're gonna eat the cut up and diced beautifully uh, uh, sauteed butternut squash. And so that opportunity worked really well for, for that farmer. And the third example is a, um, is a Hmong farmer who grew uh, and produced these, these beautiful red potatoes. And uh, again, just like the previous farmer, mar marketed those products through their traditional direct marketing outlets through farmers markets and through restaurants and other um, high-end specialty stores, um, but uh, but ended up being able to sell their larger potatoes uh, for use in for use of dicing and chopping for the school meals. So again, they were able to kind of 
look at the different market opportunities and maximize the product that they were producing for the markets that they were they were serving. Just real quickly, some tips for uh, for farmers when when working with schools to maximize their benefits and and minimize risk. Oftentimes, uh, we hear from school food service directors to start small. They they have uh, they have first started small with with farmers. Um, they'll maybe work with them for one meal or one day or for uh, one product, and so. Um, but that allows everyone to get familiar familiar with each other. It allows everyone to kind of get comfortable with the business transaction, kind of, you know, put a put a toe in the water, so to speak, before they really get into a more structured, you know, annual contract or or a more structured formal relationship. Um, obviously, both parties are going to have to set clear expectations. Um, sometimes have some uh, some substitution or backup pl plans or uh, clarify if something were to happen, you know, a disaster were to happen where they would be, a crop would be lost or uh, something terrible were to happen for a farmer. Um, farmers obviously will have to weigh whether or not establish, whether or not they, uh, they go into a long-term contract, um, which has its benefits, right? It allows for, for some security on both ends at the school and at the farmer or or pursue some opportunity buys, some of the, some of these one-off special time buys, um, special special uh, products purchased by the school. So these are kind of some tips that we use for maximizing benefits and, and minimizing the risks with with, uh, with both parties. Um, this is this is kind of very similar to what I just shared, but um, just just a little differently is oftentimes we've heard farmers. Um, eating lunch at schools to get familiar with the actual school environment, to get familiar with what actually takes place in the classroom or in the cafeteria. I'm sorry, uh, in the cafeteria, just just building their awareness and 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 knowledge. Um, uh, sometimes uh, farmers will invite a school food service director to a to their farm for a visit, so they can see their products, so they can become more familiar with what what is produced and how they're um, how their farm operates. Um, both schools and farmers um, are going to have to really open their lines of communication to produce a, a, a business transaction. You know, prioritize the relationships, prioritize create creativity, creativity. Excuse me, and sometimes have patience. Sometimes, you know, conversations take a little while to develop. Uh, that's okay. Um, as long as people are talking and you know uh, and considering that that's that's okay. Um, just just to wrap things up real quickly, for from USDA's perspective, we do have a great guide to buying local food uh, for schools related uh, for for specifically schools that covers um, that covers bidding and how schools can give preference for for local products. A lot of the same information, more in depth that Tegan shared earlier uh, during the webinar. Again, the farm to school census, as Tegan mentioned, where where everyone can see uh, what sc what school districts are are spending on local foods, what types of products they're purchasing, what types of um, meals they're purchasing for, um, and if you really wanted to go go wild, there's a webinar series online that we have that's a 12 part series for folks to really learn more. Uh, I am not here because I am I am on an assignment at USDA, but this is the USDA Farm to School team at the national office. There's five great folks here who work on all three parts of the train, uh, all three parts of the program related to training and technical assistance, uh, our grant program, uh, and obviously the research piece. The grant program I think Tegan mentioned, but it's a five million dollar grant program annually that uh, does allow for agricultural producers and agricultural producer groups to apply directly to. Maximum awards are $100,000, so, and we have funded a number of, of farmers. We have seven great regional leads across the country at each of the seven FNS's uh, regional offices. They are here to help. They are here to, to, their sole mission is to improve the use of local foods in school meals. And their sole mission is to work with schools and farmers to make those business transactions happen to develop those relationships. So uh, I would not hesitate to reach out one of, to one of these fantastic individuals. 
Um, before we turn it, o turn it over to Kara, we just wanted to say thank you so much for to the National uh, Young Farmers Coalition for hosting this webinar, uh, for facilitating this partnership, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to work together again in the future on some next steps and additional curriculum to support farmers uh, selling to schools. Thank you so much. Yeah, we would love to hear from you guys if you have specific resources or, the, or that you'd like to know more about or if there are areas where you still have lots of questions, um, you can follow up with me via email um, or, you know, if you have any questions for right now, please type them into the chat box and we can try to answer them right away. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll sort of give a couple seconds in case anybody has any follow-up questions but um thank you so much matt it was oh if you're on the phone and you have questions you can also unmute yourself and um and ask you know traditional style with your voice um yeah, and so just thank you to Matt, thank you to Tegan for all of this information. We will are making a recording of this, and so we will post that online and um, send out a PDF of the slides that were used today, as well as that recording, and some links that you can use to follow up and get more information. And this is, I think, a great beginning series for thinking about dealing with selling to schools, um, but we would love to, do more to make that um, seem more possible to farmers. And so we'd love to hear from you both successes and challenges and what, whatever else you wanna know about. Um, so reach out to me there. Um, and if you have specific questions about how the program works, definitely follow up with Tegan and Matt. Um, um, is there a resource to determine herb qualities needed? Yeah, we have an herb farmer with us today. Um, do you have information for that, Matt? I, I, I don't think I do, but can you just rephrase or, or restate that question? Like, mm, I'm going to give Jen a second to do that. But I also, I think that like how many, how much parsley is needed per meal is probably a little bit more challenging then um like it might not be a number that they already have in terms of weight yeah i i don't know the answer to that question unfortunately let's try to follow up with that jen yeah you have your email address and so uh we can try to figure out how that's done um cool anybody else have questions uh I will email in in when I send out the link with this um, this webinar recording, which will be posted on YouTube. Um, I'll send out a link with the previous one as well. Um, that's also it's on the National Young Farmers Coalition's YouTube channel, uh, so that's there too. But this we'll get this uploaded as soon as I can manage all of the like technical aspect of um, making sure it's recorded correctly and all of that. So hopefully that will be within the next couple of days. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you guys all for, um, for participating. We had people from um, all over the country here today, and that's really exciting. Uh, and thank you, uh, Matt and Tegan, so much from USDA for, for giving us all of this information and um, and reaching out to farmers. So uh, I hope that there will be more to follow up on. Definitely, thank you, Kara. All right, have a wonderful afternoon and evening, everyone. You too, thanks. Bye-bye.